Heavenly Father, we come this morning before you, always glad to be in your presence, always glad to be gathered together to worship you, to feel your Holy Spirit as it fills our hearts and our souls with his presence. Lord, let your light shine in us and let your light shine through us. Heavenly Father, we lift up all who are on our prayer list and especially those who are part of our lives, who are close to us and mean so much to us. We pray for Sharon. We, we pray for for Steve's family. We pray for all that we care for, and, and Lord, we just pray your hand be upon them. And, and Lord Jesus, we know that as we come before you, there is power in your hand, and that you can heal, and we pray for healing for all of those who are on our prayer list. We pray for their comfort. Lord, sometimes the only, the only healing they need is the healing of, that takes them from a moment of sorrow to a moment of joyful remembrance. Be with those families who go through this time. And Lord, as we gather together here, we gather not only as your children in your church, we gather as the body of Christ throughout the world. We are linked with all who call themselves Christians, all who believe in your holy power. And Lord, we call upon you. We implore you, we beg you, we plead with you, Lord, that you will find a way to stir the spirit of peace in the lives of those who would do so much harm. Lord, change them. Speak to their soul. Change them that others might live and, and can rejoice in your presence. God, we are your church, and each of us are called to be ambassadors of the words of Christ that we find in Scripture. Let us always speak boldly and plainly, as Jesus has taught us to. Be with us now in this hour of worship. Help us to be like you in the world that we live in. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Thank you for being here. It seems like we were just here just a moment ago at, uh, yesterday or day before yesterday. And uh, it is so good to see you and such a blessing to be together. I, Pam and I were communicating about the bulletin last night and we were talking and I said, I'm just looking forward to church tomorrow. I'm just looking forward to being together again. And uh, I am glad to be here and glad to be with you all. We want to welcome of course, everyone who is joining in with us. As we gather here, we gather in the name of Christ. We gather also with a mission, a mission to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. And we pray that those who can see us, those who will hear us, whether it's on radio or TV or YouTube or Facebook, we pray that, that God's spirit will, will descend upon you, that you'll feel his holy presence and that you'll find a, a home. We'd love for that home to be here. But we'd be happy for you to find a home anywhere with Christ. It is good to be here. It is good to be together. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Brother Steve. We're going to be singing out of the celebration hymnal this morning. So if you'll get that hymn book out and turn to hymn number 393. 393. We're going to sing, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. 393. Let's all stand.
asked you to remain standing for our affirmation of faith this morning. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father Almighty, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as a divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth an example of our blessed Lord, to the end, that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 517. I will sing of my Redeemer. 517. this time for ushers will come we'll receive this morning's regular offering and that'll be followed by our building fund offering
kids that can help you through Zoe, we know that uh, you'll be there with her, with her family, looking over her, and, and guiding them in the right way that they need to go. And God, we just thank you for uh, you being there for us through all the trials and tribulations that we go through in, in life. And, and we're just so honored to uh, be in your house this morning. We're here to do nothing this morning but to worship and praise you, Lord. And we just thank you again for all that you do for us. And God, we know that we would be in a few quick minutes Have you seen Our next hymn is going to be on the overhead this morning, and it's called Hallelujah, He is Coming. It's a beautiful song.
song. That's powerful, isn't it? This time we'll turn it over to Brother Steve. That that was new to me, but that was that was beautiful. We can sing that some more, for sure. That was so pretty. This morning, if you have your Bibles with you and would like to join with me in reading, I'll be reading from Luke chapter four, verses one through thirteen. Luke chapter four, verses one through thirteen. Luke four, one through thirteen. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for forty days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, All this authority I will give you, and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I will give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on, a, on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And now, when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Let the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. From the earliest days that, that I can remember, I've heard of and I've been told of the two forces that were and would be always at work in my life. There is the power of God with all of his goodness, his mercy, his compassion and kindness. It would be God that would, would be there to remind me of what good looked like and sounded like, and good was alive and well in me. I learned very early on that there was God's standards and then there was the standards of other forces to be aware of in my life. Standards that were not healthy or helpful. Standards that were selfish and foolish, demeaning and cruel. There was God's standards. And then there were the standards of Satan. I was taught that it is not hard to discern between the two if one wants to discern between the two. One looked to the creator above, the one, the, as, and as one looked to God, would be compelled to, to be like Christ, to live and think like Christ. God's standard in, invited you to worship God and to love others as you should, to be able to, to forgive, to help, to care for and about others, and to serve someone other than yourself. I was taught that often God's standard is the most difficult to live your lives by. But in the end, it is ultimately the most rewarding of all. Not only rewarding, but pleasing. Pleasing to the very one who gives us life in the first place. Satan's standards, however, were different and unfortunately more desirable to humanity than God's. His standards emphasized self. His standards called on you to, to believe that you are your own God and that what you wanted was really the only thing that should matter to you. He appealed to the worst of human nature and encourages us and tempts us to, to believe 
To believe to do what works best for you is the best thing to do. Never ever regard anyone else in your decision making. Never worry about who gets hurt in the wake of the decisions you make. Remember who you are, he says. You are your own self-serving God who can have anything you want. So work hard and serve all the pleasures you desire in your life, even if God might find them disturbing. Who is God anyway that he should have the final say in what you do? There is always a battle to fight in each of our lives. A battle between good and evil. There is the divine presence of God calling us to righteousness. And then there is Satan calling us to the things of the world. None of us escape them. It would be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it, if God's way won all the time and, and Satan lost? But all too often it doesn't work out that way, does it? It never will, I suppose. It never has. It will when the Lord comes again. As long as humanity exists on this planet together, <coughs> Satan will always be able to achieve way more than he should. And yet, between the two, between those two standards, between those two kinds of lives, stands a cross. A cross. It's God's reminder to us that even when we choose the low road, or the easy road, or the selfish road, or the road that leads away from God's will and into the bowels of hell, God still has a plan. God still has a way to rescue us even then, to bring us back. God still has a way to defeat Satan, to defeat everything that is not of him, but instead of the prince of the world. Satan may win some battles in our lives, but I promise you God does not intend for him to win the war. Christ died to make that possible. We've come to the first week in Lent. Every week until we get to Easter will be meant to remind us of what Christ did for us. Every week we will see the will of God through Christ. Every single week will move us closer and closer uh, to the cross. You and, and I must never forget or allow our minds to forget what Christ did for us. Time, time sometimes makes important things less vivid than they should be. Time allows us to pass over the intensity of God's love and the cruelty his son endured for each of us. All of it because sometimes we chose another way other than God's way. Jesus was early in his ministry in today's passage. It had not been long since his baptism and the Spirit of God descending upon him. No sooner than he begins his ministry, he finds himself faced with the ruler of the world. God's son was about to set off and save the world. But Satan had hoped that he would be able to thwart the work of God. His best hope was to corrupt the one who would bring us salvation, the salvation that we needed. If he succeeded, mankind would remain unredeemable. If Satan lost, if Satan lost, then God would prevail. And the children of God would forever have been given the opportunity to be rescued from their sins. So Satan tempted him, just like he tempts us. Jesus, you, you must be hungry. Command that these stones become bread. If you are the Son of God, Jesus, you can do that. In other words, Jesus, do whatever it is you need to do for yourself. No need to, to hunger, take care of yourself. What kind of father would let you struggle with hunger 
Feed yourself. What you need is more important than anything else. Go ahead. Your needs are far more important than proving you are God's son. But he doesn't do it. And Satan lost. Well, okay then. If you won't eat, come let me show you what I can do for you. I can give you the world. I control it. And I can give it to whomever I please, whoever I choose. Think of it, Jesus, you will have power over the whole world if you would just worship me. I own this place. I make everything happen here. I control it. Your father created it, but he and I have battled over it. But I can get people to do the things that I want them to do. I will not only cut you in, Jesus, I'll let you be the Lord over it. Think of the power you will have and the glory that will be yours. They will look to you while you look to me. But Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. I worship the one who made me, the one who created me for the mission that he has given me. Him and only him I will serve, never you. Okay then, Jesus, let's do this. You're going to go back there, and you're going to tell them you are the son of God, like they're going to believe that. Your father really is not so loving at all, is he, if he would allow harm to come to you. So let's see really just how much the Lord does love you. Throw yourself down from here. Let's see if your, your father is really the, the, the kind of father that loves his children. If he loves you, nothing will hurt you. That's what the scriptures say. But Jesus said, I'm not going to tempt my father. In other words, I'm not going to have him prove his love for me. I'm not going to test my father because you want me to, Satan. You want me to doubt his love for me. It doesn't, I, he doesn't have to prove it to me. I know who my father is. I know he watches over me. Satan loses the battle with Christ. Christ will not abandon his holy father, nor the mission that he is called to. He is determined to live in his father's will for him. His determination, his defeating Satan, is the victory that you and I, I actually need. Because of that, that battle and that victory, we are guaranteed that one day that we can be counted among the victors ourselves. Christ follows God's will all the way to the cross to redeem us when we are not as strong as Christ was for us. Look at the world. Look at it with, without blinders or excuses. Look at it without rationalizing the choices that humanity makes. Do not let Satan blind you to the realities that exist all around us. Satan still finds those who in every day of their lives think only of themselves. He finds those who lust after power at any cost. Look at the streets of Ukraine. Look at the suffering of those people. And tell me that Satan is not celebrating the cruelty that he can achieve through the humanity that exists on this planet. You can't. Because it's too plain for us to see. Some of you will be tempted to look away. I dare you to keep looking. You should. There is a gate to the streets of hell with Vladimir Putin's name on it. He still finds people who say and think, if God loved me, this would not have happened to me. He still tries to convince the world that God we serve has no feelings toward us or for us. It isn't the world in this life that hands you the struggles you endure. It's God, he says. He still tries to convince us that the cross was meaningless, a meaningless instrument of, of God's so-called redemptive work. And sometimes Satan wins. It's a hard truth, but it is a truth all the same. But Jesus proved he can be beaten 
even at his own game. Well, you see, there's another, there's another truth hidden in Scripture. It's kind of, it's right there before us, but sometimes we, we miss it. Jesus did not go into the wilderness alone. The Scriptures say the Spirit of God was upon him. It was with him. His power was not just his own. It was the, the power that God had given him in the Spirit. The Scriptures say he was filled with it. And that indeed the, script, the Spirit is what led him into the wilderness. Now, the Lord was not alone. The power of God was with him and upon him. It helped to make him resilient and, and faithful. Which brings us to yet another truth for all of us. The power that was in Jesus... It is in you too. If not, it can be. The same spirit that strengthened him and gave him the power to overcome Satan and live his life according to the will of God, it is in you too. You have it. The moment you professed him, the moment you believed in him, the spirit came upon you. It is of no lesser strength than the spirit that lived in Christ. The world is the world. And Satan has many disciples to do his bidding. Those who have given in to his temptations. They have succumbed to the ways of the world. But you and I, we are here because we believe. We believe in Christ. We believe in his power. We believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. We do all that we can to allow it to guide us in the ways of Jesus and away, as far away as we can, from the ways of the world and Satan. Yes, land is upon us, and we are on a journey to the cross with Christ. And Jesus will face Satan again. But he will defeat him again for our sake. Do not let your mind, your mind wander. Do not let your heart wander. Remember what Christ did. Think of what Christ did for all of us. Draw on the strength of the Holy Spirit. Look bravely into the story of Christ's passion. And see it as you should. And remember, he won so that we can win. He and us are made strong by the Holy Spirit of God. Temptations will come, but you have the power to say it. You can say it too. Get behind me, Satan. And leave me alone. There are two forces at work in our world and in our lives. Live by the standards of God and defeat the world and its prince. For the power of the Holy Spirit is in all of us. closing. The altar is open to you, to anyone who'd like to come for any need that you have. I invite you to come. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number nine. It's called Glorify the Name. Let's all stand. Hymn number nine.